Hello, everyone. Today we're talking about the textual metafunction, which is a discussion, as you might guess from the name, of how texts are organized, right? The textual part there refers to the organization of texts. Uh, a lot of this comes from books such as this one that I recommend always to people who are interested in language, Jeff Thompson's excellent Introducing Functional Grammar. Uh, so let's look at some examples. Now you'll see at the top, the first thing to discuss when thinking about the organization of texts is the theme. Now this is probably not theme in the sense that you know it if you study literature or if you've read about film and so on, where a theme has something to do with, you know, the overall message of the the novel, the film, what have you. What's theme mean here? Let's look, right? Here's a simple sentence. For centuries, yellow canaries have been used to test the air in mining. There are different parts of this clause, right? You can break it up into its constituents, uh, for centuries, yellow canaries have been used to test the air in mining. Now, you don't need to know for now those terms like prepositional phrase, noun phrase, and so on. That's not important. I'm just showing you that you could label each part according to its grammatical function. What is for centuries? It's a prepositional phrase. It functions here to tell us about time, right? That's not what we're talking about now. That's to do with grammatical function. What we're talking about here is just the fact that you could take those same elements, those same separate parts, the noun phrase, the prepositional phrase, and so on. And if you wanted, you could reorder them, right? Look at this. For centuries, yellow canaries have been used to test the air in mining. Yellow canaries have been used to test the air in mining for centuries. Miners have used yellow canaries to test the air in mining for centuries. What you have with these is pretty much the same elements, right? The same phrases and words rearranged into different patterns. Uh, sometimes the wording is changed slightly. If you look carefully, you'll say the wording has been changed a little bit, but the idea remains the same, right? Something about mining and air quality being tested over time using canaries. I've just highlighted yellow canaries here to show that one part, the noun phrase, being moved around, right? Uh, and so what's going on here? The, the meaning has not changed, really. I mean, maybe slight differences because of the wording changes. But really what you could say here is that you've got five different clauses here, each where the meaning is the same. The only thing that's changed is the organization. What did you put first for centuries? Yellow canaries, miners, in mining, to test the air, Different things have been put first, different things put second, and so on. If you just ask people about that, they would probably tell you that it's random or just uh, the author's choice based on her or his intuition about what works best, right? Uh, that is uh, not correct, right? There are uh, rules, or at least highly structured patterns that govern what we put first, right? Uh, the later parts of the sentence may be up to the author's choice as to what is felt to be best. But what comes first, which is what's called the theme in this, in the discussion of textual metafunction, the theme is what comes first, right? What comes first is controlled by certain rules that we follow when we speak or write, rules that you may not know that you're following, but you are following them, and that's what we're going to talk about today, right? What are the rules that control how we decide what to put first in a clause? So, uh, ah, there's one more example. So, the first element of the clause is called the theme, right? The first element, not the first word, but the first, it could be just the first word or the first phrase, right? In the case of this sentence, for centuries comes first, that's a prepositional phrase, that's the first element. Uh, it ha the word, think of how the word for here doesn't really do anything on its own. If you just say for, 
it doesn't really convey any information. But once I say for centuries, you can see that that phrase there has a, a function. It conveys some meaning about, well, time, right? As I said earlier. So for centuries is the first element of this clause for centuries happens to be a prepositional phrase. That doesn't matter. All that matters is that you can identify which word or words make up the first element. If you know grammar, obviously, that uh, is going to help you a lot because you'd say, oh, for centuries is a complete prepositional phrase. But even if you don't remember the grammatical terms, you could certainly get a feel for that by doing what I just said. By If someone tells you four, you don't really know what they're talking about. But if they say four in a time for years, for the last few weeks, uh, for every mo for every day that I've done this, whatever, something like that, you'd know that there's a, a time element there and that that's enough, right? So for centuries is the theme here. Uh, the air is the theme in this one, right? The air is what comes first. The air in this case is a noun phrase. It's got the noun air with the, the, uh, the, the there, sometimes called the determiner, sometimes called a demonstrative reference. The air is the noun phrase here that functions as the subject of this sentence. The air is the theme. Uh, you can do it now, right? You can look at this one and say, what comes first? And I've color coded it, which obviously helps, right? What comes first here is minors. Minors is the theme of that clause. So the theme is the first element. That's the first thing to hold in your head. As I said earlier, then, it's not theme uh, in the sense of literary themes, right? What's the overall topic or message of the novel, main point of the novel? No. In fact, the theme sometimes is not the main point of the clause, right? Theme here in textual metafunction just means what comes first. And in fact, uh, it can be called the micro theme or the clause theme to distinguish it from other uses of theme, right? If I was to say, what's the, cl look at the first sentence on this slide, it says this theme is not the same as theme. If I was to ask, what is the micro theme of that first sentence, or what is the clause theme of that first sentence, you should be saying this theme, because this, the first element of that first clause is this theme, which happens in this case to be the subject, but as we saw in other examples on the previous slide, the subject does not always come first. For centuries, for example, was not the subject, right? For centuries was providing adverbial information about time. So what do we need to know? There's a thing called the micro theme or clause theme. It's whatever comes first. For the remainder of this, I'm not going to say micro theme or clause theme. I'm just going to say theme. But you'll know now that theme in this linguistic discussion means what's the first element of the clause. The theme is the first element of the clause. The air has been tested. You know what it is now. The air. In this case, the air also happens to be the subject of the verb has been tested. The subject is the theme in that case. Fine. It's not always the case. As in here, this sentence starts with for centuries. For centuries is the theme, but the subject is yellow canaries, right? Yellow canaries is the subject of the verb have been used. So sometimes, as in the first case, the subject is the theme. Sometimes, as in the second case, the subject is not the theme. Keep that in mind, right? Subject does not mean theme. Theme just means what comes first. Uh, you can't even say that the theme is what the clause is about, right? Uh, in that first one, is it about yellow canaries? In the second one, is it about yellow canaries? I mean, if you ask people about what are these about without giving any more detail, they'll probably say both of those examples are about yellow canaries. No one's going to say that the second one for centuries, no one's going to say that that's about centuries, right? It just doesn't feel like it's a sentence that's about centuries. It feels like it's a sentence about yellow canaries. Uh, so it, it, it doesn't, again, I'm just saying feel here because you can ask people for their intuition about this. Um, most people would say both of those are about canaries and they wouldn't be thinking about the organization, right? They wouldn't be thinking about what comes first. They'd just be thinking about the overall message that's presented. So 
Theme is not what it's about. Theme is just about what I said at first, the organization, as you see in that final bullet point. It's how is this sentence, this clause, right? I should use the grammatical term clause because uh, these are all individual clauses, right? They are also a sentence, uh, but as you know, a, a sentence can have more than one clause. Uh, I'm going to talk about clause because it's the grammatical term for what we see in front of us. Uh, it, the discussion of theme allows us to see how each clause is organized in relation to what came before. That's what controls your choice of theme, uh, assuming you're following normal writing patterns, right? That the example, what I said earlier was if you ask people, why do you say, what's the difference between this and that in terms of the organization? When we have all the same words, they're just organized differently. What, and, and I said, people might say that that's random. No, uh, we follow patterns where we make choices about what to put in the theme, how to start each new clause based on the clauses that appeared before it. That's where I said that there are rules that we follow. You may not know that you're following them, uh, but you probably are, right? And again, rules may sound too prescriptive because of course people can are not forced to do this, but assuming they're speaking or writing normally, they'll follow these rules. Maybe it's better to say patterns, right? They'll follow these patterns that they're accustomed to. They're used to reading, they're used to listening, they're used to seeing these patterns, and so they follow them in their own speaking, in their own writing. Let's give an example of how this might work, right? Which of these two short paragraphs seems better and why? So here's one. I was born in Ottawa. Ottawa is the capital city of Canada. Here's another one. I was born in Ottawa. The capital city of Canada is Ottawa. Now you can see that those have the same information, right? They in fact have all of the same words. The first sentence of each of them is the same. I was born in Ottawa. In the second sentence, it's just the organization that's changed, right? Uh, sentence number one begins with Ottawa. Sentence number two begins with the capital city of Canada, right? So same information, different organization. Most people prefer one or the other of these. Think about it for a minute. Which do you prefer? It's not 100%, but it's largely the case that people prefer the first one. They prefer, I was born in Ottawa. Ottawa is the capital city of Canada. If I could ask a group of people about this, they would, I, I have done so many times, they often say things like, number one seems to flow better, or number one seems to have a better connection. They'll use terms, uh, they'll explain it like that, right? And I know what they mean, and they know what they mean. They just don't know the word theme, right? You can see the pattern here. Sentence number two, sorry, in example one, I was born in Ottawa, Ottawa, the sentence number two there, Ottawa, that is the theme, right? I was born in Ottawa, Ottawa. Ottawa there is the theme. It's the first word. Remember, the theme is always the first element, word or phrase. The first word there is Ottawa. Ottawa has already been mentioned previously. It's already been mentioned earlier in this very short text. I was born in Ottawa, Ottawa. When people see that, an immediate connection to the earlier part of the text, when they see that in the theme, it feels like, as people say, it flows, right? It feels like it's connected. So I was born in Ottawa. As, you don't even need to hear the rest. I was born in Ottawa. Ottawa, that's enough for people to say, ah, he's still talking about the same thing. The problem with the second one is it says, I was born in Ottawa. Then the next sentence is the capital city and it's not immediately apparent how the capital city connects to I was born in Ottawa. You may have some connect, some inkling of it if you know already that in fact Ottawa is the capital city. But if you don't, you're left without any sense of connection until the end of the sentence where you get to the capital city of Canada is Ottawa. Ah, now Ottawa has been mentioned again. Now people feel like it's appropriate. That's the usual pattern, right? That in the theme of every subsequent clause, in the theme, there will be some connection to what came earlier. 
The connection is not always as simple as we see here, where you have an immediate re-mention of an exact word, Ottawa, Ottawa. It's not always that simple, but there will be some connection in the theme to earlier parts of the text. And obviously we'll see more examples of that as we progress through. Uh, here I've spelled it out with color coding, right? So that you can revisit that if you want and notice that in both of these cases, the red part is the subject, right? So it's not even the grammatical, uh, it's not even the grammatical function of the first part. They, these are both subjects in the theme position. So they're the same in that way. So what's different? It's just what information is in that theme position? Well, in the first one, Ottawa is in the theme position and it immediately connects to what came before Ottawa. In the second one, the capital city of Canada is there, but we don't see any of those words in the previous sentence, so the connection's not as immediately apparent. It must be something, as it says, about the organization that makes one seem better than two. We therefore, another a way of saying this is that we expect themes to contain old information or previously given information. I was born in Ottawa. All of those words now, I born, Ottawa, those are now part of the text. Therefore, the next, whatever the next sentence starts with, will contain, should contain, I can't say will because people can break the rules, but what we're accustomed to is after hearing I was born in Ottawa, you'll expect the next clause to start with something that's already been mentioned, something that's already been given. So you might expect, I was born in Ottawa, Ottawa is, I was born in Ottawa, I grew up in the suburbs, I was born in Ottawa, being born there means that, something like that, right? You expect an immediate connection in the theme position to something that's already been mentioned earlier in the text. And it's important to say earlier in the text, it doesn't have, this is a simple example where it appears earlier in the text, actually earlier in the immediately previous sentence. It's not always that simple. It we expect each theme to contain information, a connection to information that was earlier in the text. It might not be the immediate previous sentence. It might be further back. Can't be too far back, though, or people lose track. And then they say, what? what's the connection, right? I bet when you're reading uh, things once in a while, you find yourself going, hmm, what's going on? How is this relevant? How is this connected? Probably what happened is either the theme was poorly developed, a, a poor theme was chosen by the author that didn't make the connection apparent, or it was connected to something that was so far back that you've lost track of the organization, right? Remember, the textual metafunction is the discussion of how texts are organized. Uh, we expect that organization, we expect each clause to contain a theme that makes a connection to something that came earlier, but not too much earlier, or we lose track. And then we feel that sense of dislocation. What's going on here? So Ottawa here, in this case, the theme of the second clause makes the immediate link to the first clause. Ottawa the second time is now old information, right? Old in the sense of you've already heard it. Okay. Uh, it, it has to mean the same thing. It has to have the same semantic value. You can see why this doesn't work, right? The clock ticked away the seconds. Second is the best you can hope for when racing against Usain Bolt. We have the same word, red seconds and blue second, but obviously those don't mean the same thing. The first one is a time measurement. The second one is a position measurement. That doesn't work, right? It's got to have some connection that semantically makes sense. It's not just the appearance of the word. Look at how some examples of how this happens. So like in the case of Ottawa, sometimes it's purely repetition, right? Here's a children's story. We have a town mouse and a country mouse. We're friends. The, ch the child hears that first sentence, a town mouse and a country mouse are friends. They hear the second sentence, the country mouse, and oh, okay. They can immediately see or hear if they're listening that the second sentence, the country mouse that's the theme of the second sentence. It's immediately connected to the sentence before. In fact, it's direct repetition, right? Country mouse. The country mouse one day invited his friend to come and see him at home in the fields. The next sentence says, the town mouse. And again, the child would know, ah, the town mouse. This is old information because the town mouse has already been mentioned. There's a logical connection here in the theme 
to something that came earlier, I can see that or hear that this story is connected, that it makes sense as a text. It doesn't have to always be direct repetition of the exact words, though. That's very simplistic, right? We, of course, talk in more complex ways. Here, the theme of the second sentence, that, uses, a, uses reference, right? There's no reason to get angry. That will only make the situation worse. You know that in that case, that means getting angry, right? What you're saying here is there's no reason to get angry. Getting angry will only make the situation worse. The second sentence theme that contains the information getting angry and therefore the connection is still made. Text makes sense. Test can progress. Uh, look here, we have uh, a more complex text from a newspaper, right? The New York Trilogy is a series of novels by Paul Auster. Originally published. See, now look, you get to that second sentence. Originally published. Maybe I should have just shown you that. Originally published and said, does this make sense to you? Does this seem like it's connected? And you'd probably say yes, because you'd see that sentence one mentions New York Trilogy, mentions series, mentions novels, mentions Paul Auster. So you expect the next theme to continue by developing one of those bits of old information. It might say is a series of novels by Paul Auster. He, and then you say, oh, he, he means Paul Auster. Great. Uh, but in this case, what we have is it says originally published. Well, that's lexically cohesive, as it says in the title of this side, right? You have published and you have novel. Novels are published. That's part of the process of making a novel is the publication. That's a collocation, right? So you see originally published and you know immediately, right, this is connected. This text is progressing with a logical organization and you just keep listening without even... I mean, nor if, it, if a theme is appropriate, you don't even think about it. You just continue listening, continue reading, right? It's when there's a problem. If it said the New York Trilogy is a series of novels, novels by Paul Auster, Mexico, you might initially be confused because you think Mexico, how's Mexico connected? Mexico is, New York's not in Mexico. Paul Auster maybe is Mexican, but it doesn't look like a Mexican name to me, right? It doesn't mean that it couldn't progress that way, but it's le much less likely than choosing a theme that matches some earlier given element, uh, earlier piece of information. Novels published, right? Originally published. I mean, I could highlight originally published because that's the phrase is originally published, originally modifies published, right? But I've just highlighted published to show the direct lexical cohesion, right? Remember, lexical cohesion means things that stick together because of uh, the meaning of the words. Novel means a book that we read. Published means the production of a novel that you're going to read. So the theme is just the starting point of the message. Each clause, each clause presents a message. The theme is just the starting point, and that theme is as it says here, locates and orients, right? Think of, you know, locate, where is it? Orient, which direction does it face, right? When you're orienting yourself, you're choosing a direction. If we look back, as I said here, uh, the New York Trilogy is a series of novels by Paul Auster. The next clause could orient, right? Could aim at the New York Trilogy. So it could say the New York Trilogy is a series of novels by Paul Auster. This trilogy, now it's orienting at that. Or it can orient at Paul Auster, right? The New York Trilogy is a series of novels by Paul Auster. He, ah, it's aiming at, the next clause is orienting, aiming at Paul Auster. What, this example here, in fact, it aims at the novels part, right? And it says originally published novels. So that's what's meant by locates and orients. We expect each new clause to have that, theme that aims at some earlier part of the text, right? Perhaps the previous sentence, perhaps earlier, probably not too far back or people get lost, as I said. Now, we're going to talk about this marked and unmarked for a minute uh, in a general sense before applying it specifically to theme, right? So this is marked and unmarked. The concept of markedness is a common one in linguistics. 
what does this mean, marked and unmarked? A good way to think about this probably from the start is just, if I held up my hand and one of my fingers, I'd drawn a black circle on it, right? I'd drawn a black mark here. I hold up my hand, you look at it, probably you'd look first at the black circle that I'd drawn and wonder what's going on there, right? That's what marked means, that certain things catch our attention more than others, right? If I just hold up my hand, you look at the whole hand and think, what's he doing that for? If I hold up my hand with the black circle, it's more likely you'll look and think, what's he doing that for? And in particular, why is that finger marked? So marked in linguistics, markedness means things that are more noticeable, more uh, unusual. It doesn't mean wrong. It just means noticeable, right? We see this in many ways. I'll show you a few examples, right? So the unmarked form is the usual one. Look at my fingers. The, usually they are not marked. A black mark here means that one would be marked, right? Uh, the marked is the unusual one, the attention-getting one, right? So this applies to many things, right? Like I said, I'll just talk about this generally for a minute. This applies to many things. Think of the pronunciation of this word. You probably know that there are more than one pronunciation of this. Now, here in London, where I am, right now London, England, the, the most common pronunciation you would hear around is can't. I say can't for the most part. I say can't because that's how it's said in Canada where I'm from. People around here tend to say can't. Not everyone, right? So... If you want to talk about marked and unmarked, you can see that in London, England, the unmarked, usual, normal, right, common, the unmarked pronunciation is can't. My pronunciation is marked, can't. And you can see how that works in the sense that sometimes if I say can't, uh, I would at the shop or walking around, whatever, and someone will, someone will hear my pronunciation can't, and because it's marked, noticeable, unusual, sometimes they'll say, oh, where are you from? Are you from America? Are you from Canada? Right? They know I'm not from here. It marks me as being not from here. They don't necessarily think it's wrong. They know that there are different possibilities, but it catches their attention, right? So in that case, here in London, my pronunciation is the marked one. I'm the one who sounds different. If we go over to Canada the situation reverses, right? In Canada, more people sound like me. In Canada, my pronunciation is unmarked, common, boring, usual. Nobody listens and says, where are you from? They hear my accent, they assume I'm from Canada. Of course, if you're British or from any other country where you don't pronounce it the same way as I do, then if you're in Canada, people may hear it. Mark your accent, they hear you pronounce it, can't, and they go, hmm, that's different, that's unusual. Oh, hey, where are you from? Visiting Canada? Great, that sort of thing, right? So that's how marked and unmarked depends on thinking about which pattern is usual, which is unusual. And also in the example I just gave on the context, right? Where are you would affect your feeling about markedness uh, in the case of pronunciation. Other ways that we can talk about marked and unmarked, think of the difference between actor and actress, right? <clears throat> Uh, I suppose traditionally, actor meant a man and actress meant a woman. But many women choose to describe themselves as actors, right? It's quite common, <coughs> excuse me now, for people to use the unmarked form, right? Uh, think, right, the unmarked form here is actor. If you say, uh, I want, if someone says, I want to be an actor, Right? If someone says, I want to be an actor, you don't know if that person's a man or a woman. If someone says, I want to be an actress, you're going to assume that person is a woman because it's much more likely that a woman would use actress than a man would. It doesn't mean a man can't, but it's much less likely, of course, right? So with, with terms like this, lion, lioness, right? If you say there's some lions over there, it's unmarked. Maybe some are male, maybe some are female. We don't know, right? If someone says there are some lions over there, do you really assume that they're all male because someone used the term lion? Probably not, right? Whereas someone says there's a lioness over there, you're going to assume it's female, right? So markedness shows up in our discussion of, of 
in, in the way gender is discussed in language, unfairly, of course, right? I'm not saying this is right. I'm just pointing out that it's a feature of language that female people, female animals, female things, things that are considered feminine are often marked with suffixes like actress, like the trust part, right? Whereas the male ones are assumed to be the default and we don't know whether it's male or female, right? I have a dog. Is it male or female? You don't know. Because it's unmarked. Morphology can be marked, right? Think of, think of making past tense in English, right? Talk, talked versus run, ran. Which one of these is more common? Obviously, talk, talked, right? The most common way to make a past tense in English is to add ed. Therefore, adding ed is the usual common way. Therefore, that's the unmarked form. The marked one is when you change something other than just adding ed. For example, run, ran. So run, ran, ran is a marked past tense. Talked is a unmarked past tense. Okay, enough, right? So that's the discussion of marked and unmarked. Which one is usual? Which one is unusual, right? Marked ones, different, noticeable. How does this apply to theme? Can you figure that out now just by looking at A and B here? They went to dinner last night. Last night they went to dinner. Which of the, you've got all the same words here, right? All the same words, probably you think of this as meaning the same thing, which it does. So the only thing that's changed is the organization. The only thing that's changed is the choice of theme. A, the theme, remember the theme is always what comes first. A, the theme is they. B, the theme is last night. That's all that changed, right? Last night appears at the end of sentence A. It appears at the start of sentence B. Which of those do you think is the more common, unusual pattern? Probably you should be saying A, right? A, the subject comes first. That's the basic pattern. Think of learning to write sentences when you were a child in school, right? The teacher probably said, when you write a sentence, first you write a subject, then you write a verb, right? I went, they played, Shubham visited, we talked, and so on like that, right? It's going to be subject, then verb. That's the common, normal, unusual, uh, sorry, that's the common, normal, usual pattern. Therefore, A is unmarked. When the theme is unmarked, as we see here, there's not really much else to say. You say that in sentence A, the theme is unmarked. They put the subject, whoever wrote it, put the subject first. Okay, end of story. With B, the writer chose to put something other than the subject first. B is marked, right? B is a marked theme because the first element last night is not the subject. So think of it this way. The writer of B chose to do something unusual, chose to put something else at the start other than the subject, chose to put the time information last night last night in this case, chose to put the time information first. That's when, it's when people use marked themes that we can start to think about why. Why did the author of B choose to put the time first, right? Uh, and that would probably, as I said earlier, have some connection to what came earlier. Uh, someone says, uh, where have they been lately? I haven't seen them. Last night they went to dinner, right? Where have they been lately? There's the last night has that connection to lately, right? Where have they been lately? Time question. Connection to the theme last night. So something like that would probably, a question like that would probably lead to an organization like B, right? So keep that in mind. That's the next thing to hold in mind, right? Textual metafunction is the discussion of organization of texts, in particular organization of clauses, in particular what is the theme of each clause, in particular is it marked or unmarked. If it's marked, you can start to think about why was that information put first instead of the most common thing. Just like if I put a black mark on this finger, you might think why was that marked instead of the most common thing, which is no mark. Right? If there's no mark, you probably don't think about each into a, right? yeah, that's a finger. If it's black mark, that's a finger with a black mark. I wonder why. That's what you should be thinking about marked themes.
right? So uh, this is what I just said, unmarked theme, the subject and the theme are the same. The subject comes first, the theme is always what comes first. So if the theme is the subject, it's unmarked. With marked themes, the subject does not come first. Something else is first. Something else is the theme. The theme is first, last night. Something else is first, like last night. Every day I, right? Every day I go. I is the subject. Go is the verb. I put every day first. That would be a marked theme. I could say I go every day. But I've chosen to put the every day first. So that would be the next question. Why has the speaker or writer put something else in the theme position? There's this word ream. It means everything other than the theme. You've heard the word now. You probably can pretty much forget about it. In the discussion of textual metafunction, theme means what comes first. Everything else is the ream. And, and, but we don't care about that in terms of organization. What we care about is what's in the first position. That's the theme. That's what matters. As I said here, not important. Let's try an example uh, analysis together, right? Reasonably simple text, but it's a good starting point, right? So it's a, here's the text. You can pause to read it if you'd like to. And now you're back. Now it says, identify the themes in the following text. Say whether each is marked or unmarked. Now, if you want to pause and identify the themes in each text here, sorry, if you want to identify the themes here, uh, you could pause and then do that. And you know what to do, right? You just have to identify, let's say each sentence. You could do it in each clause, but for now, let's just say each sentence, right? So one, two, three, four. There are four sentences. Can you pause and identify the theme in each. And to identify the theme, you just have to identify what comes first. What element comes first? What word or phrase comes first in each sentence? To identify whether it's marked or unmarked, you then have to think, okay, perhaps underline. Underline what comes first in each sentence, then think to yourself, is this the subject or not? If it is not the subject, it's marked. If it is the subject, it's unmarked. So again, pause here to try that if you'd like to. And now we'll look at how this works together. So the first theme here is once upon a time. It has to be the first theme because the first, the theme is always what comes first. What comes first in this sentence? Once upon a time. There's that time information again. The subject is there, right? There lived. I know sometimes people want to say the subject here is a rich merchant. No, I realize that it's a rich merchant who did the living. But remember, the subject just means the subject is always what comes before the verb, right? I walked, he went, they played. So although this is unusual, the subject here is there, there lived. The subject, I know your teacher may have said the subject is the thing that does the verb. That's not always the case. Really, the subject is what comes before the verb, as in this case, the there. But even if you didn't know that, even if you underlined a rich merchant as the subject, you would still be correct in that you'd know this is marked because once upon a time is not the subject. Once upon a time is the theme, but it's not the subject. Therefore, this is marked, right? And then my next question that I said you could do, well, oh, it's a marked theme. What can you do with that? Well, you might think, okay, it's marked. Why has the author chosen to mark this theme? This one, I think, is a pretty good example, a pretty obvious example. If you're t telling a story of this type, a fairy tale for children, using Once Upon a Time as the first theme immediately marks the story as a fairy tale, right? Every child who hears Once Upon a Time is going to know, ah, this is a fairy tale. It immediately marks it as the type of text that might have dragons or wizards or, as we see here, uh, oh, I thought it was princesses. Anyway, as we, this, it says three beautiful daughters, right? I mean, as soon as you have that sort of thing, right? Once upon a time, you know, uh oh, these daughters are going to go on adventures or one of them is become a, going to become a witch and the other one's going to become a, a princess or something like that, right? Fairy tales. This, this first mark theme immediately marks the text as a fairy tale. If we progress through, what else do we see? Ah, this is explaining the grammatical subject 
thing that I just talked about. You can pause and look at this if you want, but I've already said it. Let's go back to looking at the unmarked themes. Now, I did say that you could do this just for each sentence. I've highlighted the unmarked themes in blue for each clause, right? Because remember, each sentence can have more than one clause. Like you see in that second sentence, you have each clause is a subject and a verb plus whatever else goes with that subject and verb, right? So here we see the youngest was the prettiest of the three. That's one clause. And we have the clause, she was also good and kind to everyone. That's another clause. So if you wanted to mark the, the theme of each clause, you would mark them in blue as I did here. And you can see that they're all unmarked because in all of these clauses, it's the subject that comes first, right? The youngest is the subject of was, she is the subject of was, her elder sisters is the subject of were, they is the subject of were, and they is the subject of were. So these are all subjects first. Subject is theme, therefore unmarked. Not much else to say about it other than, hey, in a story for children, if you want children to follow, uh, especially young children, don't make it too complicated. These are not complicated themes. Each of these themes is unmarked, therefore you don't have to do much thinking. Each of these themes refers back to something quite quick, quite uh, close proximity earlier in the text, right? You realize that the youngest means the youngest daughter. She means the youngest. Her elder sisters means her elder of the three beautiful daughters. They means elder sisters. They means elder sisters. Each connection is quite simple, right? Just in these cases, uh, for the most part, as you see, using reference, she, her, they, and they, using references to refer back to something that came quite quickly beforehand, right? Uh, th this is a good example of the kind of thing where if, if I ask someone, does this text seem complicated or difficult? People would rightly often focus on the words. They'd say, oh yeah, look at the words here. These are all common words, right? Will children know this? Probably all of it. They might not know merchant. That might be a little unusual for a young kid, but you know, daughter, three, uh, selfish, uh, beautiful. Kids would know this stuff, right? So people would probably say this is a simple text because the words are simple and that's true. But now what you should be able to do is to say, ah, yes, another thing that is simple about this is it's organized quite simply because each clause begins with a, or almost every clause begins with an unmarked theme, a theme that makes a simple link to something that came before to show the connection. And that the only marked theme is once upon a time, but that's a marked theme that kids would always know, right? Because it immediately marks the fairy tale genre. Good. You could also include the elliptical uh, themes here too, right? Notice like when you say she was also good and kind to everyone, what you're really saying is she was also good and she was kind to everyone. So even if you put those in, uh, they were greedy and so extremely selfish. They were greedy and they were extremely selfish. Even if you put in those elliptical themes, the places where you've done some ellipsis, in this case, clausal ellipsis of she was and clausal ellipsis of they were, even if you put those in, you see it's still simple, right? All of these themes refer immediately to one of the daughters or to two of the daughters. Kids can follow this. This is a simple story. Kids can follow it because the words are simple, but also the organization is simple. This is a bit of, a, okay, not joke because it's not that funny, but like I said, unmarked earlier, unmarked themes are not particularly notable. So we just read them and keep going. Or in the case of the kids, they may be chosen deliberately because they're boring, because they're easy to process to make it easy for the children to follow the story. It's the marked themes that make certain types of information more prominent, right? Once upon a time was a marked theme. It makes prominent that this is a fairy story, a fairy tale. Uh, last night I went to a party Last night, what we have here is the theme is in italics because it comes first. The subject is underlined, right? Here, the speaker chooses to make time information prominent. Here, the speaker chooses to make directions prominent, right? 
on the back wall? Where should you look on the back wall? Notice in all of these cases, you could rearrange it, right? You could say, I went to a party last night. You'll see a nail on the back wall. Uh, you should insert the tab next, right? You could make the next at the end of the sentence or in the middle, you should next insert the tab, something like that. In this case, probably from some instructions on uh, assembling some flat pack furniture or something, the, the writer or speaker has chosen to make the sequence more prominent first, second, next, finally, that sort of thing, right? Uh, importance, right? First, you should know, then you should know. So these are some examples of the kinds of information that speakers and writers often choose to mark by making the theme marked. They choose to mark to make more prominent some kind of information other than just the subject in these cases. That's where I'm going to stop for now. There are further, you may have questions about uh, themes in in other forms of clause, right? Other moods. You can discuss the theme in interrogative sentences, interrogative clauses, the theme in imperative sentences, imperative clauses, right? There is further discussion, but for now, I think it's enough if you follow those steps, right? Look at any particular clause, decide if it's marked or unmarked by comparing the theme to the subject and saying, if the theme is the subject, that means the subject is first, that means it's unmarked, not much more to say. If the theme is not the subject, it's a marked theme, and then you can ask that question, why did the author choose to mark this information instead of just sticking with the usual subject? If you can keep that in mind, you're doing very well with your understanding of the textual metafunction. Good, thank you very much, bye.